The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Hello and welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm your host, Len B.A. I am pleased to have as my guest today, Derek Whaley. Derek Whaley is a historian and research librarian who was born and raised in Felton, California. He earned a doctorate in history from the University of Canterbury in 2018. He began researching Santa Cruz County history in 2011 and continues to do so from overseas. He has worked at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk as resident historian and at the Tech Museum of Innovation. He's volunteered at the San Lorenzo Valley Museum and Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. He is editor-in-chief for Ziani Publishing and is well known for his Santa Cruz Trains book series and also for his website, santacruztrains.com. He currently lives in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Derek Whaley, welcome to Talk of the Bay. Thank you for having me. You have done a vast amount of research, um, particularly on railroads in and around Santa Cruz County. How did you first get interested in the history of railroads here? Uh, well, the, my original uh, inspiration can be split pretty easily between growing up in Felton with uh, Roaring Camp, literally a 20-minute walk from my house where I grew up, uh, and my best friend's dad was the chief engineer of the steam locomotives there. So yeah, I always got free rides whenever I wanted to, uh, assuming <laughs> it wasn't a big day. Right. And so my interest in trains probably goes to, uh, from then. My interest in local railroad history kind of just, it arose suddenly when I went to see a talk uh, by Brian Lidicott back in 2000, I think it was October 2010. Um, I just moved back to Santa Cruz after living in Southern California and the UK for several years. And yeah, and he was giving a talk about the tunnels up in the mountains, which I'd never heard of before. And then I suddenly realized that I'd never actually asked why there's railroad tracks in Santa Cruz. I just always assumed that Roaring Camp must just built the railroad track. So I never had really thought more about it than that. Like I'd seen the tracks in, in the city because I worked at the boardwalk for several years and I saw them going up to Davenport, but I never really questioned the railroad tracks going up in the mountains. I, I just always assumed they had just been there since Roaring Camp built them. So it was only when Brian gave the talk that I suddenly realized there's more of a history than I am aware of. And so that kind of opened my eyes and I almost, within a few months, I started doing a blog, which became the Santa Cruz Trains blog, uh, that was kind of investigating these parts and putting them all together. And after a few years, I finally realized I had plenty of content. I might as well start working on my first book. And so that's how the book came about. That's great. And you've actually done um, some supplemental books on the subject, I know. And you've got others in the works. Is that right? I have several others in the works. Yeah. So my first book, Santa Cruz Trains, Railroads and Santa Cruz Mountains. When I wrote that, I thought that would be the whole thing. And its whole point is documenting the railroads that went through the Santa Cruz Mountains, as well as the Boulder branch and kind of what went beyond Boulder Creek. But even as I was finishing that, I was already writing new blog posts for the Santa Cruz branch that goes along the coast. And so I kind of started realizing I probably have a second book here if I want to, which is Santa Cruz Trains Railroads of Santa Cruz Coast. Where that would start, that was always a question. Where it would end was pretty obvious. It would end in a little bit north, depending on if I covered the Ocean Shore Railroad which, spoiler alert, I will cover the Ocean Shore Railroad. Um, <laughs> but, so the, the southern end of it, or really the eastern end, um, I finally decided it would be just south of Gilroy, where really the history of Santa Cruz railroading begins, which is a little random switch called Carnadero, um, just south of Gilroy, which is where the Hollister branch splits off from the coast of Southern Pacific, well now I guess it's Union Pacific, uh, coast mainline. And that little split, originally way back in the 1870s, the Hollister branch was supposed to be the main line south. And so that little decision by Southern Pacific to go west to Watsonville 
started there. And so that's where I start the history of our railroads in the second book, whenever that comes out. And then after all of this research, I've discovered there are so many paper railroads, railroads that were proposed but never actually came about, or railroads that they maybe even started a little bit but never quite reached their goals. But the one goal that they all had pretty much was they wanted to eventually go to San Francisco. The book that I've actually been working on for the last year or so um, has been called Santa Cruz Trains the Road to San Francisco. And it's really a, I can only describe it as a prequel to Santa Cruz Trains. It's the story of how Santa Cruz got its trains. Not literally like that, but the political, the, the economic, the, uh, the rivalries between the companies that, that got the railroads to be built to Santa Cruz and within Santa Cruz. The goal of getting them to San Francisco. Yeah, and, yeah that, and, that's my grand scheme. And I know that I, I I know there was some rail service towards San Francisco. I don't know if it made it ever made it all the way, but that it it kept getting interrupted by stretches of the ro- railroad that they had difficult ma- difficulty maintaining, and that that uh, area right past um, Waddell Creek in particular uh, seemed to have uh, come and gone with uh, rail lines a few times. Yeah, there's twenty two tour railroad was never able to uh, fill in. Um, between Scott Creek and uh, Tunitas Glen. And so 22 miles, they eventually built a bus service, essentially, that connected the two. It was a Stanley steamer, but early bus um, that connected the two. And that's the closest we ever got to a coastal railroad route to San Francisco. But, I mean, you can also say that the route over the mountains is a route to San Francisco, especially once they built the, the Los Altos branch, the Mayfield cutoff. That pretty much went straight from Los Gatos all the way up to Cupertino, Palo Alto, and was a, it was a quite direct route. And even today, we still have a route to San Francisco. It's not used because the coastal, the Santa Cruz branch line is cut. It's uh, not operating really right at the moment, but that goes through the Pajaro Valley, goes up through Gilroy, and then goes straight up. So we technically have a route to San Francisco, which is not used anymore. Right, yeah, Pajaro Junction. I the trains go by there that are going directly between, um, you know, all points north and all points south. So, some potential there. You mentioned Roaring Camp, but Roaring Camp was kind of a late comer, right? Didn't wasn't that just built in the early '60s? Yes. Shoot, I'm blank on that year. I think it was founded in 1959, but I think the first train ran in I want to say '62. Okay. So yeah, it's a late comer and. Although all of its narrow gauge railroad locomotives are original, they aren't original to even California, I believe. Right. They're they pick those up they're all somewhere. In. Yeah. yeah. All right. And they, they built that. That line is not historic. That line was built for the park. Um, we did have historic narrow gauge railroads in the mountains. In fact, we had them in several spots, but that was not one of them. That mountain specifically has never been harvested. The, uh, that property that Roaring Camp is on is actually still owned by the Welch family today, which also used to own the uh, Henry Cow Park. All right, which they sold to the state. Yeah. Um, so I know the the railroad started in, I think, uh, the 1870s in this area. What was this region like before the arrival of railroads? Remote. <laughs> I, I start off most of my books talking about just how remote Santa Cruz was. So Santa Cruz was an extremely remote area uh, through shipping, and it did have a a high number of piers and wharves along the coastline compared to anywhere else on the California coast. And that's because it was so remote, so the easiest way to get uh, industrial goods out was, so we had the lime industry, we had the leather industry, we had lumber, other quarried goods. I'm trying to think what else there's. Yeah, so shipping was important uh, to get most of the industrial goods out. There were routes through the mountains, but they were pretty rugged. There was the main road through Soquel that went over to San Jose. There was Bear Creek Road that was pretty much what connected Boulder Creek in its earliest days. There was Graham Hill Road, which connected Felton to Santa Cruz. And there was Mountain Charlie Road, which connected santa cruz to also los gatos in the bay area and so those were kind of the main routes through um other than that there was the pajaro valley 
and the um oh, which i forget the name of the pass but the one that uh, mount madonna uh has and those are those are the main ways out over land and they they all require going over a mountain so it's any really large loads of anything you have to uh, compensate for so you can't take huge freight loads over that so the coast was really the main key and so the town was very small like under ten thousand in the whole county for a lot of its early history and so that's always something to keep in in mind is up until the arrival of the railroad santa cruz was not a massive place it was a huge industrial center but was not a thriving population center right and and in the 1870s those those roads were all dirt roads and the vehicles were all horse drawn so that's got to be a huge limiting factor so when when did railroad development begin and what areas did it serve well, actual railroad development, as in railroads that actually went somewhere <laughs> and were completed, um, started in 1874. Well, actually, really, it started 1871 is when the branch line from Gilroy um, was begun. And that's really an important part because that's what put Watsonville on the map. And so there was a couple years there when Watsonville was the main shipping point for half the county. And it became a huge political issue because Watsonville didn't want to pay for, or the Watsonville residents didn't want to pay for a railroad because they already had a railroad. So they weren't going to benefit greatly off of a railroad to Santa Cruz. And so th this became a huge political issue. And even though they lost multiple times in the fight, uh, they never really got over it. And if you look at some early maps from the mid 1870s, you actually see when they're surveying for the Santa Cruz Railroad, it get completely bypassed Watsonville. It was going to pop in south of it, well, no, west of it, um, and kind of loop mm. under, cross the river uh, closer to the ocean, and then swoop up to Pajaro, where it is today. And this had a this had an interesting effect on the Watsonville population because they suddenly panicked at the last minute. They're so like, no, you can't leave us off of this route. And so... It, if you know, train just really the railroad tracks really skirt the edge of Watsonville. It's just just uh, outside the town, really, and that's because it was a last minute save. Had they not spoken up and made a big deal out of it, they were going to be left off entirely. But they they spoke up at the last minute, so the train swooped up. I guess it swooped east to hit them before crossing the river and crossed further upstream than where it was supposed to along the Pajaro River, and so that was a interesting moment in uh santa cruz history and part of the thing that i'll talk about in my road to san francisco book is the politics behind where the route was going to go and who was going to fund it because that was actually a huge issue that i think is quite relevant even today when we have all these debates over who's going to fund it why is it is it going to make money uh who's going to benefit from it and so these are all important things and they've been important things for the last 140 years yeah, and I I know that route through Watsonville. It's you know it's kind of going through what's you know the what became the industrial neighborhood is still the industrial neighborhood that's just um, I guess that's west of of the real downtown um, and doesn't really serve much in the way of residential neighborhoods at all before it just disappears and heads towards the coast. So it's um. At least, as you say, it's right there on the edge of town. It's somewhat accessible. They would have missed them all together otherwise. So that's that's interesting to note how the politics uh, governs these these developments. You know, in reading some of your historical account about the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, I'm, I was amazed. I didn't realize the rail line ever extended beyond Boulder Creek, and it, it extended quite a ways. But more, you know, more to me, even more amazing was how many stops there were in places that barely exist anymore. Like between Felton and Boulder Creek alone, there were 12 rail line stops, including places like Bonnie Bray and Brackney, but, you know, <laughs> Siesta, Harris. I mean, those places don't exist. And, and also, you know, Glen Arbor, which everybody who lives in the valley knows is a neighborhood on the edges of, of Ben Lomond. And uh, Newell Junction, which is pretty obvious, near where Newell Creek comes in. Um, and then there were a lot of spurs going to industrial sites, mills, and various other things. And all of them, at least after uh, their initial startup, had passenger service. 
And I wondered, I wanted to ask you, how important was the passenger service in populating San Lorenzo Valley and turning it into a tourist destination? That's an interesting question. Well, I should start by saying passenger service is never the thing that provides the majority of pro profits to industrial railroad lines. And so when Southern Pacific built these lines, actually South Pacific Coaster initially built those lines, when they built those lines and extended those lines and added the stations, they did so usually because there was industrial reason. There was a mill there, there was a quarry there, um, there's something that drew them. There are a couple exceptions though. And what's interesting is most of those stops were what we call flag stops or whistle stops. They're places where trains didn't, there was no station. In many cases, there wasn't even a platform or a shelter. It was literally just a sign in the ground and you just, you, you raised a flag or hit a little lever and it would signal to the train to stop here because there's somebody that needs to get on. Or if you're on the train, you pull a cord and you signal to a driver that you want to stop. And that, that was pretty much standard for this era. Now the exceptions were places like Brookdale. Brookdale had started off as a freight stop and then it evolved into a huge tourist destination and the wealthy it, the wealthy people from the bay area loved going to brookdale uh what they call it, um huckleberry island the not actual island that's across from the station was a very popular place um siesta was started specifically as a freight or as a um passenger stop for fred swanton and his friends uh fred swanton's the one who built the boardwalk initially and so he built his house there. He invited a bunch of his friends to move into the neighborhood. And so that was started as an entirely uh, residential area. And from what I can tell, it did okay. I mean, it was a bunch of wealthy people, so they wanted big tracks. So there, there's really only probably six or seven properties there initially at the time, plus a few more across the river. But that did fine. Brookdale was actually a rare success. A lot of the properties did sell in Brookdale but I've been charting some of the uh, subdivisions and I'd say about half of Brookdale subdivisions sold and half of them didn't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of them are up on the hillside that didn't sell. So even today they're parceled out up there, but you can't really do much with them. <laughs> uh, but then there's other places like Lompico. Today you think of Lompico as like, oh, this is a, a relatively successful subdivision. Like there's a lot of people that live up in Lompico, which is true. That was also sold as a railroad subdivision, which is, kind of hilarious because the closest railroad stop was not actually accessible to Lompico because they never built the road to it. <laughs> and Lompico was such a bold and ridiculous thing that almost all the parcels didn't sell. The ones that did sell were in the first couple of the sections that were near the, the um, stream at the bottom of the valley. But they have, you can still look today on, go on Google Maps on the uh, parcel view. It's ridiculous. There are literally these little tiny little lots all over the hills that you won't see a single structure in because it just failed completely uh, there's these are all over the santa cruz mountains and a lot of them use the railroads as a motivating factor to get people out there but they just weren't realistic because nobody had actually gone out there to actually look at the property they just drew it on a map drew a bunch of lines in the ground said okay this is gonna be a road this is gonna be a, a property and that's just how it is and so I'd say when it comes to residential growth in the bigger towns like Boulder Creek and Ben Lomond, um, even places like Glen Arbor and Brookdale, uh, the railroad did really help. Uh, other places, probably not so much. It maybe brought some initial people there and like got that first attention, but it probably didn't help long-term growth that much. It, it just got, it, it got come to some of the first settlers there. Um, and Felton is probably one of the most notable ones where probably the railroad didn't do a ton because Felton already existed before the railroad and while it was kind of a hub felton is kind of this weird uh crossroads between where a whole bunch of people already live and where a bunch of industries already existed but a lot of industries were also moving away from felton by the time that the railroads arrived so it's hard to tell the impact of the railroads to felton except as its long-term existence as a hub place yeah wow well if you're just tuning in to talk of the bay here on ksqd uh, my guest is Derek R. Whaley. He's a historian and research librarian. He was born and raised in Felton, California, and uh, has done a ton of research about local history. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief uh, for Ziani Publishing, 
And um, among other things, the author of Santa Cruz Trains, Railroads of the Santa Cruz Mountains. So, Derek, and you're, you're talking about this sort of speculative development along the rail lines to, you know, try to sell property. And, and clearly, you know, a lot of that is purely to make money. I, I'm familiar with that phenomenon in the Los Angeles area, where there were all kinds of schemes of advertising new subdivisions in that part of the state and trying to bring in customers from all across the United States. They, you know, they ran ads in East Coast newspapers for people to buy sight unseen, beautiful sunlit lots with ocean views, you know, in Los Angeles. And a lot of it was a scam. I mean, the, the lots existed, but the, the, you know, they were often barely buildable, too steep or too small, um, no road access, <laughs> no ocean views, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think that must have been a phenomenon everywhere. And I guess, you know, we see that part of that in our history here too. I know that, that as things developed and industry grew in the valley and, and more and more, um, these are pretty much extractive industries, more and more products were able to be shipped out and you know workers brought in and and whoever resided in those areas obviously got passenger service out of the deal um how much rail traffic was there in the peak years oh rail traffic i i I'll admit it's one of the things i'm i'm not as good at um recording but for the san Lorenzo valley um at its very peak it probably they probably ran four trains north and four trains south a day um mostly for um sorry but those are passenger or mixed trains um mostly for commuter services and so they would go they'd go up to boulder creek pick up passengers come back and meet at felton where they transfer them onto the uh southern pacific or south pacific coast train that would be going through the mountains to the bay area um, in its earliest years, it took about four hours to go from Santa Cruz to San Francisco. So it was a very early morning train to get a mid or a late ish morning uh, arrival. So obviously you had to be a businessman who had a lot of uh, flexibility in your schedule if you're going to be pulling that off. Uh, and then you'd be arriving back home pretty late. Um, in later years, they got it under three hours. I believe it was two hours and 55 minutes. I want to. I'm not 100% certain on that number. Yeah, and as the years went on, they, uh, the number of cars got reduced, um, especially once automobiles became more common and the Glenwood Highway was built. Uh, the number of cars in the trains would reduce, and then eventually the number of trains themselves reduced. They also tried some creative things, like uh, they had this electric car that they tried running up and down the tracks in the San Lorenzo Valley, but it couldn't really handle the curves and the steep grades in a couple spots and so it didn't really work out hmm. but they certainly experimented with trying to save a little bit of money here and there uh but yeah in the end i mean one of the reasons why the santa cruz or the boulder creek branch specifically shut down uh in 1930 for passenger service was because they're just cars were easier and more efficient to get over the hill because of the transfer to felton you could just drive a car straight over bear creek road or uh, the Saratoga, uh, no, whatever it's called, um, Highway 9. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good, take one of those well, there roads. There was a Saratoga to toll road for a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a Saratoga toll road. But that was, that was a couple decades earlier. Yeah. But yeah, you could take the uh, the main road just out of there to get to the Bay Area, and you'd cut a lot of time based on, uh, versus taking a railroad, which that could have been resolved a long time ago had they ever actually continued building the road to Saratoga, the, 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 sorry, the uh, railroad to Saratoga, which had been proposed multiple times. Um, but they just never actually did it. So since they never did it, the cars, unfortunately, especially in the San Jose Valley, cars really won out. Yeah, and with um, four, you know, trains a day that were passenger and mixed cargo, plus presumably some freight trains that were just bringing out product, how did trains yeah. pass each other? What do, what do they do to that? Because most of the line, it seems, is is a single track that that I've seen. Yeah, I I actually... A lot of people try to pull that as a, a fast one on people when they're uh, debating the Santa Cruz branch because the Santa Cruz branch is a single track uh, right away as well. And they say, oh, but like you can't have multiple cars coming because they're going to be facing each other. But they actually they had quite a few passing sightings 
Um, ben Lohman specifically had uh, several passing sightings, but they had ones elsewhere too um, along the line. So, and they were all scheduled in such a way that they didn't it didn't directly conflict with each other. I mean, they also had excursions, special freight runs, and other uh, you know uh, maintenance of way vehicles. Like they had several cars at any given time along these right of ways, and they were all single track. The, the main line through the mountains was also a single track. And they managed it just fine. Like as long as the schedule is good and there's good people that are, are able to handle the different uh, the different directions and the, the conflicting what am I trying to say <laughs> the conflicting the trains it should be fine. And yeah, and Felton also had a turntable. Uh, Border Creek had a turntable, and so that also helped make sure that tra the same trains are going both directions. So, you know, they may have four going north and four going south, but those are the same four going both directions. They'd go up to Border Creek, get turned around, and then go back the other way. Right. Yeah. And so, obviously, so if you have a siding at a station, train pulls off onto the siding at the station, then a train going yeah. the opposite direction can just go on the main line past the siding, and then you've done with your loading and unloading, and you move on, right? So Exactly. Huh. Yeah, so interesting. So, but it had to be coordinated, obviously. Yeah, um, it, and actually, the, the main line over the mountains and the uh, coastal, the Santa Cruz branch line, were both on um, was it automated block signal systems. And so, in the later years, they were completely coordinated by a remote system. And in the earlier years, there was actually a bit of a relay system. I believe it was from between, I think it was between Alma and Glen Glenwood um because those were the two passing spots and they actually would hand off a little baton to the station master at those stations and when the when one person had the baton the train going the opposite direction couldn't move until the baton reached to them and it pretty much it ensured that no train would ever be on the in the two long tunnels at the same time um because there are two mi mile plus long tunnels between alma and glenwood and so right. you definitely don't want a collision in those tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, yeah. And and I want to get that's what I want to get to next is that line that extended continued from Felton Junction all the way over to uh, past um, Los Gatos to the Vasona Junction. But before I do, I just wanted to ask um, because I was it, until looking at your book, I wasn't familiar with how far the line extended beyond Builder, Boulder Creek. How far did that go? Up, up um, San Lorenzo Valley. Ooh, I, I believe it was another eight miles. I'm trying to remember the exact length. Wow. I should have that on hand, shouldn't I? Um, well, it's a, it, there's it a lot in the book. The if you can remember it all, yeah. you're doing good. <laughs> That's true. Um, so it went another uh, two miles. Uh, two miles north of Boulder Creek was a place that today is called, well, today, it was called Wildwood. Um, there's still Wildwood Road there, so if you know where that is. And the Wildwood subdivision was originally the Cunningham Mill property. And the Cunningham Mill, we believe, was the site of the original flume mill. Before there was a Boulder Creek branch, there was a flume that went far up the San Lorenzo Valley and brought wood to Felton. Uh, it was always, it was lumber, it was cut lumber. That went the, and it had to be cut, it was loaded on the flume. So the flume's mill, we think, became the Cunningham Mill. And the Cunningham Mill is today at a place called Wildwood. And then another mile, another two miles beyond that is a place now called Riverside Grove. And that's where the biggest mill was in pretty much the entire San Lorenzo Valley. That was the Santa Clara County, you know, Santa Clara Valley Mill and Lumber Company, which most people just know was Doherty's. Huh. Uh, and it's a well-known mill because it began its operations in Los Gatos Creek at Lexington and slowly but surely meandered up into the hills, up Bear Creek Road, down Zianti, uh, I guess Upper Zianti Road, where it was when the South Pacific Coast Railroad was built in the late 1870s. So it was already there. The railroad was built. They kept harvesting for another seven years. And then they finally, they went back to Bear Creek Road and kept going down and they eventually was built, uh, built their uh, last mill over uh, four miles north of Boulder Creek. And so that, yeah, at the bottom of Kings Creek Road, that's right. Um, and so that was kind of the big destination. They, they more or less, they didn't necessarily own everything north of there, but they were pretty much in charge of harvesting the timber north of there. 
Um, so they, what they do is they lease properties. They get what they call stumpage rights. And so they'd lease, lease a property from a property owners up there and they'd remove all the trees and they'd harvest the trees and then they'd return the land to the people and then they could use the land for farming or resell it or whatever they want to do. And so that went all the way up to roughly a place called Tin Can Ranch. And Tin Can Ranch is a very old name. I wrote an article on my blog about it. Um, I wrote it a couple of years ago and it's I was great name. a few months ago. I know. And the name, it's surprisingly early because tin cans, I think actual tin cans date back to about the 1820s, but they weren't super common in the West until the 1850s. And even then, there weren't that many people in the mountains in the 1850s in Santa Cruz County. So the fact that somebody went out there and they found tin cans out there and immediately, like it was rare enough of a discovery that someone went like, well, this is a tin can creek. And now they're going to build a ranch at the bottom. So it must be tin can ranch. And it's just, okay. So that's more or less where the terminus of the Doherty extension railroad, the, the railroad north of Boulder Creek was. Um, by that point, it would have been a very temporary railroad. It, um, parts of the right of way still exist. They did have to do some cutting. So I give you go up to the Saratoga toll road, um, which is a, 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 a walk, a, a walk within Castle Rock state park now. Um, if you go to the, the Saratoga Toll Road uh, kiosk, that's what it is, look just behind the kiosk and you can actually see a little bit of the old railroad grade. It crosses Highway 9 to the south and you can follow it a little bit to the north, but there's a lot of poison oak there. So I'm giving people a warning right now. Uh, <laughs> beware of poison oak. Don't go there in the autumn. You're going to get poison oak if you think you're not. Um, go in there when the poison oak's ni- go in there nice and red and that's when you'll be safest. <laughs> right. Red or, or off the branches altogether, generally. Well, once it's off the branches, you're doomed. <laughs> That's what I got poisoned up when I was little. <laughs> yeah, you, you can get it from the branches, but it doesn't reach out as far, which is, is one That's of the problems. True. That's true. <laughs> um, and just for listeners who aren't familiar with flumes, um, flumes were used a lot for moving um, lumber. And in some places in, in the world, in the U.S. particularly, you, used for moving whole logs. And, and what a flume is is just a, an artificial water channel just deep enough to hold whatever f- wood is being floated down it and kept at a sort of a relatively shallow um, pitch so that the flow of water is at a predictable and slowish speed, but good enough to carry um, wood downstream to whatever destination it was. So uh, originally that whole stretch of rail line north of Felton was, they depended on for moving lumber on the flume for that and the railroad basically took its place, right? Yep, that's exactly it. Um, the, the the railroad for roughly eight miles north of Felton uh, originally was the flume. Um, that got you to Boulder Creek. And then north of Boulder Creek, the flume stayed intact for a couple more years, and it was slowly dismantled and replaced with the Doherty Extension Railroad. Yeah, so, cool. But the, the entire reason the San Lorenzo Valley has a railroad to begin with was because the flume couldn't operate south of Felton there weren't enough uh, natural water sources south of Felton. And so they finally decided that they needed to build a railroad to connect Santa Cruz to Felton just to get uh, the logs transferred that last six, seven miles. Uh, We're going to take a really short break and we'll be right back with more with Derek Whaley in just a few seconds. Don't go away. If you're just joining us, my guest is Derek Whaley. He's an historian and research librarian. He was born and raised in Felton, California. He now lives in New Zealand. Uh, but he is uh, has made an extensive study of Santa Cruz hi- area history. Um, he is editor-in-chief for Ziani Publishing and um, also author of a series of books on trains in Santa Cruz, um, including uh, Railroads of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Derek, the the big one, it seems, when it comes to railroad history here, is that line that extended um, from Felton on over the mountains, um, across the San Andreas Fault, through all that steep landslide-prone territory, um, all the way through Los Gatos to Vasona Junction. And I wonder if you could tell us about how important it was and, and how long it took to build and well, uh, <clears throat> I think one interesting tidbit, and this I, this is going to be breaking news for most people because I only learned this uh, literally three weeks ago. 
Um, I've been doing a lot of research on motives and uh, reasons why things are the way they are in the Bay Area regarding railroads. And one thing I discovered very recently was that James Fair, the man who financed most of the South Pacific Coast Railroad, which is that railroad you just described, he lived in Oakland, also lived in San Francisco, but had a lot of property and business interests in Oakland. Uh, he was pretty much founding the city of Newark. And he owned property in Santa Cruz in the 1870s. And it made me suddenly realize something. The number one motivation for him building his railroad to Santa Cruz was he wanted to get to his properties in Santa Cruz without having to take the wagon over the mountains. <laughs> We, we make fun of people like Elon Musk and stuff, you know, going out to space and buying all these ridiculous yachts and their private jets and everything. Well, there were no jets at this time. There's no spacecraft at this time. Uh, you can have your own private boat, but you still have to go out on the ocean and it's, it's still going to be a dangerous trip. Easiest thing to do, build yourself a cheap railroad. And so he did a very smart move. He went with a cheap railroad option, which is a, a narrow gauge. He bought a line that already existed, which was the Santa Cruz and Felton Railroad. So that was six miles of his 80-mile railroad built. He bought the right-of-way and part very partially completed line of, I believe it was the Santa Clara Valley Railroad, um, which was, they owned a bunch of right-of-way uh, in the Santa Clara area, but they hadn't really succeeded in building much. And so he was, a, and he, he gathered a bunch of supporters that wanted their own, had their own personal interests in getting this thing done. And by doing this, he managed to build his railroad that could get him to his properties in Santa Cruz. And so it's just, it, the motivations behind things are not always straightforward. Like a lot of motivations for railroads are either to sell property, if it's a passenger line, or to reach an industry, if it's a freight line. And sometimes freight lines will have passenger service and sometimes passenger lines will have freight service. But in this case, it seems to be that he was doing it mostly for personal reasons because he had something like the equivalent of four billion dollars today so he had a lot of money and he just <laughs> wanted to throw it around and he got a bunch of backers that what a fun project a right? <laughs> yeah and i mean you got to give it to him he succeeded but it also explains why he pulled out of the project soon after it was finished it, he finished the last of his project in 1887 which was the uh, new almaden branch uh, which connected the campbell to the uh, new Almaden Quicksilver mines. And almost immediately after that line was done, he sold the thing to Southern Pacific because he got what he wanted. He, he wanted this railroad. If he wanted to keep using it, he didn't care. He, he, he owned it. Like he still had some shares in it for a couple years and I'm sure he got free rides on it the rest of his life anyway. He got what he needed. Um, wow. the, there's all this talk about rivalry and stuff. But the funny thing is, how much effort he went to to get this thing. It took four years just to build the route through uh, from uh, Al Alameda Point, the Alameda Mole up in, o in near Oakland, um, all the way down the coast. That, that only took about a year and a half to build from there to Los Gatos. And then it took about two and a half years to build from Los Gatos through the mountains to Felton. The section from Felton to Santa Cruz, it had its issues, but it was already there. It just needed, uh, curves need to be smoothed out. They had to build a new tunnel, uh, pretty much underneath Highway 9, not quite underneath Highway 9, but close to it. Um, and that tunnel is now gone, but it was there up until the 1990s. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had to build two mile long tunnels. And he also, for some reason, and this, again, maybe this is a, as a sweetener for Southern Pacific to eventually buy it. He built a lot of the route to a standard gauge quality, even rights of way, where he didn't need to. But it's almost like, he knew that eventually he was going to sell it, so might as well get at least some of it, some of the stuff done. So some of the bridges could be upgraded easily. Some of the tunnels were probably a little bit bigger than they needed to be. Like he did little things that seemed to be potential sweeteners for eventual buyer, I'd say. Hmm. And so very interesting how how the railroad projects their motivations can be uh, not quite as clear cut. Yeah, no kidding. And you mentioned that there were that route included two two tunnels that were over a, a mile long. I guess there were a total of four, I think, between Felton and, and Los Gatos, if I remember right. Um, between Felton and Los Gatos, uh, yes, there uh, five. 
There are five. five. Trees, All right. Uh, but two yeah. of them were really extraordinarily long, um, yeah. over a mile long, the Summit Tunnel and the Glenwood Tunnel. Um, what was it about the engineering and construction of that line that drew national attention? Well, not much drew attention. The, the Laurel to Glenwood one, just to get that out of the way, um, that was the second longest. It was only a little bit shorter. And that's the one that Highway 17 passes over today. From what we can tell from people that have uh, found creative ways to look into the tunnel, it seems to be mostly intact still beyond, behind the uh, caved in entryways and stuff. Uh, and so, I mean, engineering wise, that one was almost completely through soft stone that they were able to carve through without much difficulty. The other one, which is called the Summit Tunnel because it goes underneath the Summit Ridge and underneath Summit Road, that one was a much bigger difficulty. Uh, the southern end of it, I guess, yeah, southern end, western end, it gets confusing once you throw in a uh, railroad, but we'll say geographic west side of it was not that difficult. It was the same soft kind of stone, so they were able to make pretty good progress through that side. And Oh, and I should mention that Chinese workers were involved in all of this. Uh, at least most of the tunnels were built entirely by Chinese workers. This tunnel is the one exception because the eastern side of this tunnel ended up uh, not that far in. They encountered the Zianti Fault that you mentioned earlier. And the Zianti Fault is one of the main fault lines of the, uh, the coast range in our area. And... I mean, the 1906 earthquake was a good evidence of what happened. Uh, the 1906 earthquake shifted that tunnel, I believe it was eight feet. Um, so a major shift. Yeah, an eight foot Big lateral timing. move you're talking about yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, and there are there is a picture of that shift. And that itself, that actually ended up being great timing because they needed to rebore the tunnel anyway for standard gauge train. So good timing on the, on the uh, earth's part. And nobody was injured related to the railroad during that. Wow. But 1878 and 1879, things were a lot more dangerous because it also was letting, uh, there was, um, there was coal, there was natural gas, there was oil, and it was all seeping into this tunnel. Ooh. Oh, well, because if anybody knows anything, there was a very small oil rush in Moody Gulch, which is, which Highway 17 goes up. And even today, there's a little bit of oil that comes out of Moody Gulch. They did do some uh, mining for a while. It was never really profitable, but that same fault line goes all the way up to where the Summit Tunnel is. Wow. While they're working on it, that became a big health and safety problem because they have to use, uh, they didn't have electricity really at this time, so they're having to use open flames. And so they they are trying to find ways to flash off this up going deeper and deeper in this tunnel and even when they're working 24 hours they reached a point where they really just couldn't get ahead of it and so there were multiple explosions over a, a several month period which saw dozens of chinese workers uh die as a result of these explosions and eventually they had to get cornish workers in who had different mining skills because they're from a different part of the world and they ended up having to complete the eastern side of the tunnel because Honestly, the Chinese people just, they were over it. They didn't want to see any more of uh, themselves and their friends die trying to build this stupid tunnel. And so they finally swapped out. Um, the Chinese workers went to work on other parts of the grade and the Cornish workers came in to finish the job there. And fortunately, once they did bore through and reach the other side, the combination of the airflow, a pilot light that was plugged into the spot where they, they found out where the natural gas was specifically coming from so they stuck a big pipe in there and put a pilot light on it and the combination of the airflow and the pilot light seems to have mostly controlled it because there was never any more explosions from it and they finally sealed it up completely later on when they concreted it wow so yeah wow yeah and i you know even to this day there is still a handful of working wells up in san mateo county but it's all in the same geology of the santa cruz mountains so yeah, that earthquake, uh, the 1906 earthquake, it's, you see a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of photographs of, you know, damage to fences and roads and sto so forth in the Santa Cruz mountains. And your book includes some great photos of, um, you know, rail lines that are sort of warped offset. And, and of course, as you mentioned, the, the tunnel itself um, shifted <laughs> and just incredible luck that there was, there were no trains in there at the time that it happened. 
In the book, you describe a long series of mergers and acquisitions between rail companies. At, you know, as you mentioned, um, South Coast um, doing, you know, doing its own um, construction and then sale. It seems to have been a really active, speculative, and monopoly-building market, as much as it is now for modern-day tech companies. Um, how did all that buying and selling of rail companies affect the economics and politics in that era? The local scene was actually really the California scene, um, especially Central California, was really dominated by the Southern Pacific Railroad. And Southern Pacific just had a habit of buying up everyone else. And so in Santa Cruz County, everyone eventually got bought out by Southern Pacific if they weren't Southern Pacific to begin with. So you have things like the Loma Prieta Railroad, which was always a Southern Pacific subsidiary. You have the Santa Cruz and Fountain Railroad, which was a which was bought by the South Pacific Coast, which was then merged into Southern Pacific Railroad. It was run as a, it, so the South Pacific Coast was run as a, because of narrow gauge, it, didn't, it wasn't compatible with a lot of the other systems. So it ran as a semi-autonomous uh, subsidiary under the name South Pacific Coast Railway for about 20 years. Um, after the earthquake, they finally standard gauge the tracks. And so kind of the facade dropped but legally, it actually remained its own separate company until, I think, 1937. So it was quite late. Um, I think that was because they had a 50-year deal. So 50 years was would it match when the company was formed. Um, but then you get weird things like the Coast Line Railroad and the Ocean Shore Railroad were formed within just a month of each other. And the Coast Line was a wholly owned subsidiary of the Southern Pacific. And both of these two railroads claimed that they were going to connect Santa Cruz to San Francisco via a coastal route. But it became that the coastline slash Southern Pacific wasn't really committed to it. And they mostly just wanted to get to Davenport where they were building a Santa Cruz Portland Cement Company's new plant. So it's just 11 miles north of Santa Cruz. Like all they wanted to do is get there. And that's why they bought the inland route where the ocean or the, um, the routes were parallel to each other, I should say. Um, the route, the two tracks were parallel to each other and they actually hired the same contractor to build both lines so there's <laughs> some weird coordination going on there they do deviate at two spots but there's some weird coordination going on because they even built their trestle together the ocean shore was supposed to be two track or two sets of tracks while the coastline was supposed to be one so essentially there's three tracks that were going to run parallel to each other up to davenport and then beyond that who knows because it extended its line further but what ended up happening is the earthquake interrupted it. So the ocean shore actually got there first because the ocean shore had a lot of financing. And even after the earthquake, um, the economic crash didn't hit until 1907, but ocean, but, and that was their whole thing was building this one route where Southern Pacific had lines all over the state that were suffering from the earthquake. So they had to you know, repair the existing routes. And so ocean shore railroad had about a year before their economic situation just completely collapsed. And so they got to Davenport first and even worked with Southern Pacific to ship things on their behalf from the new cement plant. So weird thing is going. Then in the end, the coastline slash Southern Pacific still made it to Davenport, still cut off Ocean Shore's supply line. And since Ocean Shore could never connect its 22 miles north of Davenport with the northern branch that made it down south of Half Moon Bay, it just it still didn't go anywhere. And so at the end of the day, Ocean Shore Railroad still failed. And to this day, we still have railroad tracks that go up to Davenport that are Southern Pacific ones. But if you've ever walked any of those tracks up there, you'll see there always seems to be like a service road or kind of a soupy slurry of right of way on the coastal side of the tracks. And that's because that's where the one track that was actually built of the Ocean Shore Railroad was supposed to be. And it was there until about 1920 three, which is when those tracks were pulled. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of legacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we only have a few minutes left and I'd love to uh, give you an opportunity first to, to tell listeners how to find out more, how to connect to Zyani Publishing. Um, I know you have a new book out um, that you edited and compiled, which is Writings of Eric Otto, who was a columnist for many, many years in Santa Cruz and wrote about local history. Um, and uh, encourage you to plug that quickly. Um, but I just, 
I just wanted to say, you know, you stayed in the conclusion of Santa Cruz trains, railroads of the Santa Cruz mountains. Santa Cruz County owes its wealth and status first and foremost to the railroads. So I wondered if you could just expand on that a little and then anything else um, that you, you can squeeze in in the couple of minutes we have left. Yeah, I strongly believe that Santa Cruz would have pretty much from a cul-de-sac of commerce. Everything would have been stuck through difficult roads over the mountains or shipping had it not been for the train. The train really freed up the region. It made it so tourists could come to the area and tourists, as we all know, some of them decide to stay. Unfortunately, that means increasing property values, but that's good for property owners, bad for people trying to buy property, but that's neither here nor there. But <laughs> the I, it, trains brought people to Santa Cruz, brought Santa Cruz to people's awareness. It brought industry to Santa Cruz. It brought wealth to Santa Cruz. Most of what we have in Santa Cruz today came because the railroad went there first. And while yes, property subdivisions that use the railroad as part of its promotions maybe didn't succeed. Yes, not all businesses succeeded that use the railroad. Like that's with any business, even today with automobiles and planes and whatnot. Like the fact of the matter though, is that the trains are really what put Santa Cruz on the map. And even today, when you look at maps of the United States and the world, you'll sometimes see Santa Cruz is one of the places on there, despite the fact that it's a pretty small place in the world. And I guarantee you one of the reasons is, is because a hundred years ago, Santa Cruz was put on a map and people never took it off. It still has that little bit of relevance because Santa Cruz or because the railroads made Santa Cruz a place worth looking at and going to and visiting. I mean, we've, we've had presidents, we've had celebrities, we have the Santa Cruz beach boardwalk and we have the resources that the, the California has used. Hawaii was built largely off of a lot of our lumber and uh, quarried items. Like places across the world benefit from the resources. I mean, I live in New Zealand and I can buy Driscoll's berries at the grocery store here from Watsonville in the Pajaro Valley. And even today, some of those are shipped on railroads. So, I mean, it's amazing yeah. how much railroads helped develop the uh, Santa Cruz County. To, to uh, promote my newest uh, book, so Zioni Publishing, and me in particular, I was investigating some history of local railroads a while back. I came across this fun guy named Ernest Otto. He wrote histories for the Sentinel slash the Sentinel News back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And what I discovered is he was an old fellow by the time that he was writing those. He had been working for the Sentinel or the Surf, uh, which was an older newspaper, since 1881, when he was 10 years old, and he was a, a newsboy. He used to wow. deliver the newspapers. And what I discovered is he had these amazing little retrospectives. And he, unlike most historians, most historians like me, we, we look in the newspapers and we find information and we analyze it and we pull some other supporting evidence and we, we make a story out of it. And, you know, sometimes we can be successful and sometimes we can fail because we're missing parts. Ernest's approach is all retrospective. He is pulling stuff from his own memories because he lived in Santa Cruz his entire life until his death in 1955. He went on like three vacations his whole life. <laughs> and so all these articles they have, and they're just, they're mostly on Santa Cruz City, not everything, but most is on Santa Cruz City itself. And they're just amazing little articles. And I, so what I've done is I'm collecting them together. The first volume just came out. Um, card called Our Old Santa Cruz, which is taken straight from the name of his old book, I mean, of his old uh, articles. And I have volume one out. I don't actually know how many volumes there's going to be because he may start reusing content. I haven't yet found him reusing content. He reuses little elements of stuff, but he hasn't like reused the entire article yet. Uh, but I suspect there will probably be six or seven volumes in the end. So what I've done wow. is I take about 100 of these at a time, put them into a book, pair them with historical photographs, um, largely taken from the UC Santa Cruz collection that was dropped back in 2020. Uh, and a lot of those are, are very relevant to the articles that, uh, that I'm copying from him. And I'm just editing them, cleaning them up, making them consistent with in quality and standardization and making them available to the public because they're fun stories. And seriously, 
I, I sent the thing off to my mom as a surprise, just as like, hey, mom, what do you think of this? And she was just like, oh my goodness, this guy's like the coolest guy ever. I wish I could meet him because he's seriously, he's the guy on the street. You could just go wandering around and he just walk up to you and be like, hey, got any good stories for today? What, what's been going on? Like, <laughs> what, what's happening in Santa Cruz? Like, he went swimming on the beach with the mayor and the sheriff. He'd go out on the fisherman's wharf, the, the old railroad wharf, uh, and he'd just, He'd interview uh, the fishermen, say like, "Hey, what what stuff are you guys pulling up today? Like anything good on the menus?" Like he was just that guy. He'd stop celebrities as they got off the train and go, or anybody off the train, and say like, "Hey, you guys seen any celebrities? Any good news happening up uh, in the Bay Area today?" Like, That's great. Those are the kind of stories that he just would tell. That's cool. So, well, we're out of time. To pick up yeah, and they can get that at ZianiPublishing dot com. Is that right? Um, well, you can get it on Amazon. Oh, there and, you go. Uh, it will be at Bookshop Santa Cruz. Our, our, days, our old Santa Cruz. Great. And you can get it at Bookshop Santa Cruz uh, within the next few days. It's on its way. Fabulous. Oh, there's your. there you go. Your Christmas gift for all your friends who live here and the ones who want to live here. Derek Whaley, it's been a real pleasure. I wish we had more time. There's no, so much more I'd like to talk with you about. Um, but I really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, thank you again for for the for your time. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's been great.